Hi, my name is Glenn Pontier. I'm the Executive Director of Sullivan Renaissance. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to talk to you about our 2015 program uh, before our afternoon speaker is announced. And uh, it's an honor and pleasure to see you here for Sullivan Renaissance Annual Conference, something we've been working on as a staff for about six months. Uh, Sullivan County is clearly about to embark on a new journey, one which has the promise of taking us to a place of prosperity and inclusion if we're smart, diligent, and willing to engage all of us. Um, those of you that were here this morning know, uh, might not know that uh, the whole uh, events this morning were translated uh, into Spanish and headsets were distributed to people that speak only Spanish. And it was done simultaneously. Um, I got a, had an opportunity to listen for a couple of minutes, but I don't speak Spanish. so. Uh, a special thanks to all of our sponsors. Without them, our job and your job uh, would be a whole lot more difficult. And I'd like to give a shout out to the Sullivan County Democrat, which produced today's special section. Uh, if you'd like information about how to become a sponsor, uh, see me or another Sullivan Renaissance staff member today. And you should know that the staff is meeting many of you individually today. Uh, if you'd like to speak directly with one of us, you can sign up at the welcome desk uh, for the Sullivan Renaissance Salon, which is ongoing uh, even as we speak now. Um, as always, the staff is willing uh, to meet in your community at a time of your choosing to answer questions or help you with the grant applications. Our applications are not a test, so we'll give you the answers on how to fill them out. Um, so reach out to us and we'll come uh, during the day, in the evening, on the weekends, whenever you want. All of the program elements with which you're familiar will continue. So if you're returning, uh, you pretty much know what our program is. But take a look at our 2015 brochure, um, which outlines the funding opportunities. And you can visit our website, uh, SullivanRenaissance.org which goes into uh, great detail about what we do. Applications for the next round of beautification grants are due March 18th. Uh, it's uh, March 7th. So uh, we're getting there. there. There is enough time. Uh, so if you have questions, give us a call. We'll come out and we'll help you fill them out. Um, you'll know uh, very soon whether your project is approved because we name the recipients and the grant people that we give grants to on April 25th. So you fill out the application by March 18th, by April 25th, you know. Uh, with that in mind, let me tell you about a few new initiatives for 2015. And the first is that our spring forum will be on a Saturday. And that's when we actually give out the checks to you. And for a long time, it's been on a Thursday night. Uh, this year, it'll be on a Saturday afternoon. It will be at the CVI Center. And uh, we're going to include some of the elements traditionally um, connected with our annual conference, which include the expo. So you'll see some of the people that were in the past were at our expo. They'll be at our annual, at our spring forum. Uh, we're also going to have some key uh, workshops, including one on how to make videos about your community and projects. And you should know that that workshop will be led by the film editor from the TV series The Jinx, which is appearing on Sunday nights on HBO. Um, Sullivan Renaissance continues to make our program more accessible to everyone who lives and visits Sullivan County. And outreach to the summer community will continue with our popular Community Mitzvah Award contest. And Dr. Tarlo talked a little bit about that. And we also have seasonal demonstration grants for summer bungalow colonies and businesses and camps. And we've also added outreach to individuals who speak Spanish through Sullivan Renaissance and Espanol. And portions of this conference, as I said, uh, were translated into Spanish. We've already had our first uh, Spanish-only language gardening class. Um, y vamos a tener más. New programs for businesses and municipalities. Some of the details are in our program brochure. And just let me say that we have programs to provide technical assistance and some funding to businesses that want to enhance their appearance 
and to municipalities to maintain their public spaces. So ask me or another staff member about these. Much of Sullivan Renaissance of what we do is made possible by individuals who serve on our steering committee. And these people's names are listed on the back of our brochures and periodically in the press. Um, and they help us vet our ideas. Um, they help at events like today, those that were welcoming you at our table. Uh, and they serve as ambassadors to our projects. If you would like to be considered for membership on the steering committee, please contact Sullivan Renaissance or see one of the staff members today. And uh, when I get done, uh, just uh, you know, uh, grab my arm and say, Glenn, I want to be on that. Um, you don't have to be, but it's uh, something you, we're happy to consider folks for. 2015 grant applications are also available. You can pick up copies at our welcome table. There are a lot of dates uh, to remember, and so I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, many of them are on the screen, look at that, uh, and you'll find them listed in our program brochure. And that's it, I'm done. Um, remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and um, this uh, whole proceeding today is being broadcast live over YouTube, and uh, people that have questions can uh, uh, tweet them in, and we have somebody answering them. And welcome to the rebirth of Sullivan County, both literally and figuratively. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Diana Wiener, who is our horticultural coordinator, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to introduce Kirk, who joins us today with a rich background in both commercial and community horticulture and community involvement. He is a recipient of the Pennsylvania Nursery and Landscape Association Green Achiever Award for advancing horticulture in Pennsylvania and has been a business consultant to the green industry for years. He is a national lecturer on horticultural topics from the 18th to the 21st centuries, especially being uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and John Bartram. You have to see him in drag. Gardens that he has designed and installed have been presented with outstanding design awards by Pennsylvania Landscape and Nursery Association, the Perennial Plant Association, and the Association of Professional Landscape Designers. He is one of the most knowledgeable and entertaining gardeners that I've ever had the pleasure of spending time in the garden with. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a fellow member of the Garden Writers Association, our incoming president for the GWA, Kirk Ryan Brown. This is, the, there we go. Isn't it so much better when you can hear me? And, and yet, it's been a pleasure so far not to be heard. I've been sitting in the back watching your reactions to this amazing group of people that we're talking this morning. And putting six people with that amount of prestige and power, I can't even, I can't even stand up on that platform. No, I can't. Look, see, my eyes are not quite as, as clear in, in my great age. But the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. You know, now this is a cruise line's awful, awful commercial. I've been using this quote for years. They don't even know that Proust said this. Do you imagine that? <laughs> And, and I, I keep thinking, well, how do you get a copyright on, a, on, a, on another person's quote? It doesn't work that way. But the operative word here, and I think it's the one that most people were struggling with this morning, because the one thing that Sullivan County is doing right here and right now is the one amazing word in this sentence, which is seeking. We are seeking what we would want to be when we become oh, I don't know, successful, seeking, you know, opportunities, seeking a brighter light, seeking youth and millennials, seeking multiculturalism, seeking all of those things that we can do when we think about what we would prefer 
to be in the grand and optimistic sense, without being political, of course, you know, we never want to be political. But I propose to seek out the genius of the place. And it was mentioned at the very end. They were talking about the special connection in Sullivan County. And I recall this quote, and it, it, it harkens back to 2,000 years of Augustan Republic history. Genius loci, the genius of the place. What does that mean? What passions does that stir in a natural audience? Well, you know, in a European tradition, nature was preserved. Nature was guarded. It wasn't open to the masses. You couldn't go stag hunting in a duke's forest. You would be, well, you would be shot. Now, of course, here in this country, we are egalitarian, we are democratic, and access is open to one and to all. And now, because we have it, we don't necessarily want it. Isn't, now, that's hard for me to understand. You know, in Europe, they, they killed people over getting into Versailles. Now, of course, you pay $22, and it's, all, it's good for everybody. You get your picture taken in the Hall of Mirrors. It's, it's just, and those stags are endangered species, because now everybody can hunt them. If everybody can do something, what is the value in it? And nature, more than anything, is something that we overlook and we undervalue. And I'm here to talk about that, because I think you in this audience and with this group, this Sullivan Renaissance, recognizes that. The genius of the place, genius loci, it is Latin, I apologize for that. I study words and the use of them. And in this case, it means the protective spirit of the place. Hmm. The protective spirit of the place. I think that's Sullivan Renaissance. It is a spirit that you can feel. It was almost palpable here in this auditorium this morning. You could touch it, taste it, sense it. You know, it was, it was moving through this crowd. Very well dressed, too, I might add. Thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> you know, and yet, this was, was immortalized in a poem that was written to an aristocrat in England. It said, consult the genius of the place in all that tells the waters or to rise or fall, or helps the ambitious hill, the heavens to scale, or scoops in circling theaters, the veil. You know, you have this amphitheater out here that was a celebration in 1969. Alexander Pope probably understood that they would be coming to Woodstock. He, I'm sure he said that. Calls in the country, catches opening glades, joins willing woods and varies shades from shades, now breaks or, or now directs the intending line, paints, paints as you plant. Look at this. Look at the children. Aren't they nice? Yes. And as you work, designs. It's all, all of a subject. It's all of a unifying thought, nature, in place, with a spirit and a sense of belonging. The guiding principles of landscape architecture that were articulated much, much later are the design should always represent the context in which it was located, the genius loci. That's a, a much narrower definition of the Latin. But in Prior Park in 1734, it was Alexander Pope who said, this needs to be a special place, and you've got the money, we've got the time, let's make a park. And then they had Lancelot, known as Capability Brown, come and play. And he got the name Capability not because he knew anything about plants or nature or particularly cared, but he knew how to build dams. Damn it. And he did. And so, in retrospect, our view of nature is generally black and white. It exists. It lives. And we pass it by. And oh, well, yes, it seems to me that that did there. And, and it's only in the here and now that nature jumps at us. And we can see it for what it is. Nature in full color, in dazzling array, 
is what we must encourage those that would come after us to participate. We know, you know, we know what it's fun to play with these, these little coloring boxes that we've got in planters here. You know, isn't it just lovely that we can do it? But we close the doors and make it all sudden a private institution when it needs to be a public grace. Here, it's spring there, and in my memory of visits to New York in my childhood, I look back on those escapes that we took to the plaza and then crossed the street into the park, and it's fuzzy. I just remember a lot of stuff and bustle and, and crowds, and yet in the spring in New York, it is the one access to nature that everyone has, and then it comes into bloom. It's color, it's life, it's light, and it's activity, and we all recognize it when we see it. It's just in hindsight that the mirror is yes or no, or gee, that's too much work, or no, I can't recognize that because the kids aren't interested today or this week or this summer. But 150 years ago, in the 1860s, when it was new and thrilling, that great esplanade that leads down to the Bethesda fountain, you know how crowded it was, but how, how seriously undertoned it was the great common denominator. Let's welcome everybody in the city to this great coming together place. Let's experience it and be excited by it. And still to this day, you can put color on those steps and know that it is an active and vital and very much shared and experienced place. We all know it. Bethesda, it's the one thing that Olmsted and Vox allowed as a sculpture. It was the first commission in New York ever given to a woman sculptor. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> now I swore I wasn't going to be political, but the Angel of the Waters, the Bethesda Pool, is a natural space. And the story of Bethesda is that the, the angel comes down and touches, disturbs the water. And if you are the first person to go into the waters as the fountain is disturbed, you will be cured. You will be healed. And it was put into this fountain, in this setting, immediately after the Civil War, as a way that the nation could come together and heal. The great healing space. And you go there today, and it is quite used. Isn't that nice when parks are used? You go to Central Park or Prospect Park or any of the parks in the city, and life could never be more colorful at any time of year. Even now, you look outside, there is some, some color. Look, you have that green fencing up there. <laughs> Don't laugh, that's all we see, you know. Sometimes it's, oh yes, we have green fencing, that's good. It, it, it helps me. The enjoyment of scenery employs the mind and thus through the influence of the mind over the body gives the effect of refreshing rest and reinvigoration to the whole system. Olmsted wrote this when he was working on the park. You know, it took him a long time to get to the job, but once he did, he was very defined. We forget that there is a health-giving benefit to the work that nature would provide us with. It is. And the black and white can become color in summer. Oh, this country. Oh, look at him. So stuffy and so, so puritanical. So, so New England. But what did he say? That there should be celebrations with pageant and pomp and parade. And here in Sullivan County, you are a group of people that recognize that. You agree with the majestic John. Look, you celebrate with parades. It's marvelous. I think, I think every community should be challenged to put on something in red, white, and blue in July with flowers. And with this, with this renaissance, you're talking about mighty endeavors so that you're talking about feats of engineering. And I think it's marvelous that you, you facilitate this. People wouldn't think about moving stone and brick and rock and all of the things that come and go with, with public access and majestic views. I don't know who captured this, but that image of that rainbow over that house of worship. Whoever puts that together in nature? It's a wonderful thing to recognize. Colorful waterways, welcoming gateways. I love coneflowers. 
in whichever color they happen to be available in this season. You know, every spring you go to the catalogs and they're just full of all of these things that entice and delight and challenge. And, and uh, John here now, he would take something that you couldn't possibly even grow in this zone and take it into his basement because he husbands nature. We don't think about husbanding nature. And the word, the very word, the very essence and issue of what we do here, Renaissance, it's so 17th century. You know, you think of, you think of, of people painting ceilings and, and, and dripping paint on popes and, oh, I'm sorry, you know, ooh, dead. And, and yet, uh, you know, if you, go, if you go to a dictionary, in, in, in the original use of this word, they were thinking of how new it was. Isn't that amazing? Everything old is new again because it means rebirth. You are anticipating a rebirth. Your photos illustrate your excitement and your enthusiasm for it. it it's a resurgence. It is. It is, it is absolutely burgeoning with energy and enthusiasm and forsythias blooming and a reawakening. I like this one in particular, especially here in Slippy Hollow. This is Rip Van Winkle territory. Go out and get that man out of the hole, you know. Oh, it's just such a marvelous thought when you can do this as a restoration or a renewal or a revival or a renovation. Oh just because you can, and you are facilitated in that through this great Sullivan Renaissance. Oh. Growing communities. You know, I spoke at America in Bloom this year, and I got to meet representatives from 35 communities across this great nation, and they all united for one reason, the discussion of how nature can combine forces with communities. What a very unique perspective on life. It's true. You know, you plant a seed and it takes root and it grows and it sends up a shoot and then it sends up a plant and it develops. It's kind of like, let me think, children. <sighs> God allows you to forget the bad parts. <sighs> Mine are 23 and 29. My wife elbows me and says, no, it's 22 and 26. I don't remember. But they're lovely now that they're gone. Oh, I, was that a laugh of recognition? <laughs> We're taking them to the Philadelphia Flower Show tomorrow. We're all meeting there and having lunch afterwards. And it's, it's great because we, we raise them at the Philadelphia Flower Show. I used to do meetings there every year. And, and they would, would register everybody. So they know all my friends and, and they know all them. And, and every year that they haven't been there, they, the people say, well, where, where, are your, where are your sons? And I said, well, they've, they've outgrown nature. <laughs> you know? And now they're one to come back. So there is a reward. There is a renaissance. They do come back. It's more than growing communities. It's greening communities. That's what you're doing. That is the essence that I speak out everywhere I go with whatever uncomfortable hat and terrible shoes. Where, wherever I meet a group of people that are dedicated to improving their lives and improving the people around them and improving their communities, it's all about greening. And I hate to use and will not use that word sustainability because that for me is an S word. You'll go to sleep where the politicians will say, foul. You know, it, it becomes a Shakespearean tragedy in huge dimensions, and it's leer. Oh, instead, I would have dirty hands raised to the camera lens. Yes, it's me. Pick me. Make me plant that plant. You know, here we are. And it's community landscapes, art and practice. That's what we're talking about. And we're going to talk about a little detail, because you can't do the big picture without talking about the little picture. So I'm here to do it all in an hour. And that's hard. Cities are great sores. They're terrible places to live. Jefferson knew this. That's why he went to Monticello. That's that little mountain where he can keep all the little people at bay. <laughs> you stay down there, I have my garden, get away. You know, great man, great garden. Hated cities, got away from them as much as possible. Spoke French, nobody understood him. <laughs> you know, this is New York, 19th century. Hasn't changed much, clothes. Transportations, they don't have that many cables anymore. Look at that. It's, it's, it's lifestyle. You know, 
We all, we all wanted to move to the city. We all said, oh, let's go there. That's, that's where it's safe. It's, 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 it's dirty. <laughs> you know? Any, anybody live here? Seriously, I've never, heard, I've never had anybody admit to it. But I probably would live there. That's one of the tenements, you know, Lower East Side. We all, we all, had, we all came from there. And, and we recognize it for a place that, that we wanted to get out of. We wanted to come. Who knew that Sullivan County was here? You know, they weren't talking about it back then. And Washington Irving was only writing those, those lovely little stories about people going up and down the Hudson. It never got one county back. It's true. If people can decorate and build their homes to symbolize values, values such as prosperity, education, patriotism, they will be happier people and better citizens. Andrew Jackson Downing, born in Newburgh. How far is that? 35 miles from here. You could spit. The man was the original Martha Stewart. If he had lived, he would have been credited with Central Park as opposed to Olmsted and Vox. This man went to England, found Vox in a hole because it was a Vox hole. And, and the man stood up because he was only like three foot seven and he looked at him and he said, oh, what could you do for me in America? Anything you w w want. Because he stuttered and couldn't... It's difficult for me to talk as Vox. Anyway, Andrew Jackson Downing brought Vox to this country and said, let us start a revolution. A green revolution. Amazing stuff. Just amazing stuff. Look. This is what they found in the cities. Workshops, sweatshops, they called it. People died. No naturalness around them. No green smoke and drudge and, and children. Labor force. Ugh, exploitative. Plant spacious parks in your cities. We heard it. There was a whole movement the parks movement. Then there was the national parks movement. And, and we went through the end of the 19th century and into the 20th and on into infinity. And here we are in the 21st, and we seem to have forgotten all that has come before. There is a theory written by Andrew Jackson Downing. Is there anybody, this, is, this, is, this is current events stuff. Has anyone read it? No, seriously. Isn't this one of the easiest reads, I mean a little dense, but isn't it one of the easiest reads about what gardening, horticulture, landscapes in America could do for you? If you haven't, I strongly write, put this on your, on your, your bedtime reading list. It's, if, if nothing else, it's, it's a great uh, a sleeping pill. You know? A good home will encourage its inhabitants to pursue a moral, a moral existence. Can you imagine? We send people out to plant parks to improve the common morality. I almost have to sit down to conceive of that. Let's, let's talk politics for this. Let us fund horticultural involvement to improve urban morality. I don't know if that would sell anymore. But a proper city park, then, should provide escape from the city, and it did. Greensward, they called it. It was the first massive organizational plan for a park in this hemisphere, and it was designed to be a sweep, a large, unbroken swath of land, and it was the first park that sunk access roads underneath so that you wouldn't notice the road to preserve that swath of open sheep's meadow. It was the first great park in this continent to preserve the suburban space in the urban environment. It was 847 acres in the heart of New York. Can you imagine how crazy those people were? I mean, it doesn't get any easier than taking 847 acres of prime real estate away from anybody to have them hopping mad. What are you thinking? What are you doing? It was the largest public works process ever undertaken since the construction of the pyramids. Thousands and thousands of day labors. 75 cents, 75 cents, 75. At the end of every day, it was just amazing. Moved mountains. It is a chance to form and train the tastes of the nation. And it did. We were lucky. And the word form 
jumps out at us. Because here was the man and the garden in a time and place where the elements and principles of design took over. Form, in capital letters, became the most used element of design, along with line, light, space, and then we can continue on to color, texture, time, and repetition. So this is now part of the, the detail work, how you can all go back into your own communities and do process work immediately upon receipt of this information. And here I can give you a mnemonic for all of those that have struggled with how many issues are involved when you're designing something and you just can't keep it all in your mind. Use fall, scatter. F is form, L is line, L is light, S is space, C is color, T is texture, time, and R is repetition. And then it goes into a sentence because they always told me that you needed to put a mnemonic into a sentence. Leaves are elements of fall scatter. I, I, I give that to you. That is my gift. You can take that home and, and, and give it to your children and they will look at you and use their opposable thumbs and they won't find it. <laughs> and, then, and then you'll have it over them. It's all good then, you know, it's true. Form, it's, it is the, I think of it as a rounded thing. It is the shape of things and you need to consider it when you're including it in a design. If you go to the US Arboretum, you can see form in all of its many, many guises, round, conical, oval, weeping, horizontal, and vertical. I like in a commercial application to use something weeping. It's so unorthodox and it's so much a, a, a piece, a focal piece, and it's singular generally. Dan Hinckley did this at Heronswood in the old days, and he had this, this weeping evergreen, it weeping into that bowl of water. How many paragraphs can you write on that? Now isn't that just that you know, weeping tree into this solid filled bowl of water? Or Thomas Hobbes in his jewel box garden up in Vancouver had things weeping over walls just to soften the line. It was marvelous. Horizontal lines, Bow Bridge, classic example. And that, that horizontal is found in the midst of all of the surrounding verticals. Look at that. Architectural elements need to be considered and appropriately used. Paolo Soleri used this at Arcosante. He passed away last year. Great visionary architect and, and lifestyle guru. Make lo lovely bells. You know, if you have a, an Arcosante bell in your garden, every time it rings and the neighbors come over and knock on your door, you think, oh, that Paolo, isn't he cute? You know. But, but all of those Italian cypress, you can't grow them here, but do something similar where you have those exclamation points. Or get Dale to come up, Dale Chihuly. He puts glass as elements in gardens, and, and it's unique, and it's unusual. And it makes you stop and think, why is that there? If you can get people to stop and think, why is that, why are they, why are they doing that? What, what challenge to my senses? What, what smell? What, what color? What, what sound? If you can challenge people to notice with all of the din of, of the digital world that surrounds them today, you have been successful in alerting them to the realities of nature. You go to the, the, uh, the Space Needle in Seattle and Chihuly has his glass museum now next door. And, and in the garden, everything is vertical and beautiful and colorful, and sparkly bits on the side. I, I, I distract easily, you'll notice. Let's see, you wanna to touch this. <coughs> at, at the NYBG, in the children's garden. It's fun, too, if you think of shapes in the way that you can play with them. Here, at a collegiate setting, the line is what drives the design, that, that great semicircle. Well, they have their graduations there when the, when the weather cooperates with them. And it's, it's a, a temple, a natural temple. Here at Mount Cuba, the line is all important. And if you have a line that stretches to infinity and you put a bench at the end of it, invariably you will get people walking through that. It's, it's, it's a magnet. You have to think of things that will entice and entrance and, and signify nature in the designs that you do. Look at this. Now here, here is an example of an urban homesteader. I, I, I lived in two historic districts and I rehabbed more than f two dozen houses as treasurer of one of the organizations. And the very first thing we did was stabilize the outside and we thought of them all in a linear sense. They did the same thing here. Now look, 
That is urban homesteading, but look what they did with it. They added lines. How impressive. And paint. Even more, I like color. I'm a colorist, and so it's good. Olmsted used lines. This is, one, this is in the first parks systems in the United States, which was Buffalo. Imagine that. Buffalo is the first park system. Before Boston, before Chicago, before them all. Parks systems started in Buffalo. Has a marvelous scent. Blur the edge of a line. It makes it easier. Look, here. Blurring the edge. Take the, take the sharpness, the crispness off. Look at this. Ipomoea goes nuts with water, and it takes all of the edges off the stuff. And here at the State Botanic Garden in Athens, they, they have a trials garden, and it blurs the edge of stone and rock. And, and from a distance, all you can hear is the music in the background. It's, it's making people look at things differently. That is the part. Even Frank Lloyd Wright, who is as much uh, against putting plants up against the foundations of his house as any architect I've ever known or read of, always believed that nature should soften the form. Even in his most horizontal phase, nature needed to sharpen the view, but preserve the nature. And then you go there. Oh, we were there last summer. This is from then. And it never ceases to amaze me that the location is everything. And the lines become secondary to how the lines sit in nature and on nature and with the water. Prospect Park, the example, perfect example. There's no straight lines. The only straight line is the existing Quaker Cemetery. And they moved a few bodies so that they could cut the upper corner off. You see that? Right up there. Look, see? Right there. Let's take those bodies out, we don't need them, and we need to soften that line. And if you go to Prospect Park, I was there, oh, just a couple months ago, it is the most representational, still in existence, of any of the Olmsted Vox partnership parks. And it's lovely. And it's all curves. And it makes the views stretch out into infinity. So curve the line. Look here, in Chicago. They had a problem, a couple, this is now about 15 years ago, they had planted this crop of, 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 of pear trees, of calorie pears, and they all died. Oh my. Now, what would be the, they didn't have the money to replace them, and there, the lawyers were involved. Who's going to replace these? Who's going to make them good? And Adam Schwerner, who was in the Parks Department at the time, he's now with Disney. It, this explains that. But he, was, he, he said, well, let's not take them out. Let's paint them. And let's put orange construction barricades through them. And then only mow every two weeks in alternate patterns. So it looks like a, a big, large playing board. <gasps> it was free. And people freaked. <laughs> what are you doing? Those are dead trees. Look at that. And then the other half of the audience, who were true Chicagoans, said, well, that's entrepreneurial. How lovely. Look, and it's even colored. And, and all of that construction barricade, we weren't using it anyway. How, how much sense is that? So Chicago lost, and Disney won. He's the head of horticulture at Disneyland now. Nice man. And Jimmy Turner at the Ch Dallas Botanic Garden. Look, they can do boxwoods like no, no one else. And he did that wide cut, and it's just, you, it's, it's, it's sinuous, it's sensual. I hate to use those words with nature because you want to take your clothes off. And it's just, it's like, oh my God. And so Jimmy left the Dallas Botanic Garden and now he's working in Australia because they needed horticulture there. Lincoln Park, curvilinear. You know, how many have walked a labyrinth? If you haven't, you need to. And if you have, you understand that you need to walk them more because it's a touch with nature. And wherever they appear, I walk them now. And, and, and it has nothing to do, well, it, it, it started certainly, it was the, on the road to Jerusalem, it was the pilgrimage. But, but anymore, it is, it is one of the few urban contacts we can have with a natural environment because it, it erases from your senses the, the urban environment around you and takes you to a selfish inner core of silence and harmony with nature. 
kind of like what we were going for here at Woodstock. I have to keep thinking, you know, it's right over there. Look, and now there's no turkeys. Oh my God, that was a bourbon that I drank in college. <coughs> Curvilinear can be in what you plant. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a crepe myrtle. Uh, LA, but it's just wonderful. You can do it with hardscapes, too. We just don't think of them enough because hardscapes are generally run in rectilinear patterns, only because somebody thought they saved money. Hmm. Light at the end of a long tunnel is what we should all aspire to. It's what Vox always did with his bridges. There, was all, there is always a pedestrian walkway under a bridge designed by a box in a park. And you always go through it, and this is what you see at the other end of it. You can do it, you can do it in Central Park, you can do it in Prospect Park, and you need to do this. Because the view you have, the light that, that pulls you through that space, is like walking into heaven. The Chinese gardens everywhere do the same thing. They always had the bonsai collection in a white-walled, separate space. And you should go at all times of the day because the sun is charted over that space. And the positive negative, the black and white, the image that you take away is as much the shadow against the white wall as it is of the nature. And go to Chanticleer. If you haven't, this is my favorite garden. I don't get any residuals, nor do I get royalties. But of all of the gardens in the world that I go to, and my wife will tell you they're limitless numbers, Chanticleer is the one I go to always and often. And it takes me to a place that I don't get in any other trip. And in the mornings, if you're there before it opens, and the hillside filled with dyscampsia, and the morning dew, cutting the light is something that you have to experience. You need to consider light in a plan, and it is a pleasure when it works to the designer's betterment. Even if you have a small pool of water that can catch an afternoon's reflection of a setting sun, or that you can float glass balls on that again refract light and cast more highlights across building fronts. Anything to break up and scatter the light. Like this city, it was the White City in 1893, the Great Columbian Exposition, the Great Current Wars between Edison and Westinghouse. And Westinghouse won because they came up with a cheaper, better way to make 200,000 light bulbs and alternating current. Everybody thought it would kill them. Instead, it cured them. And everybody since then has thought that outlining light, outlining buildings with light is a design statement. Well, there's a reason for that. It just works. And Olmsted designed the layout. And he is the one that said, but we should outline these buildings because they will reflect on the water's surface. Capability Brown again. Great elements of landscape design. And yet, even he said, it seems useless to describe Chicago. What it was when I saw it, it will not be by the time this is read. That happens in every municipality. No sooner do you achieve something and finish something and get it done, especially if it's a garden or containers for a summer's parade, and they're gone. And next season, something else is coming on to challenge you. It is constant effort to renew and revitalize and, and renaissance. Is that a verb? It should be, here at least. Work on that. Color is an important adjunct to any design. And I've been afraid of this for most of my life because color is scary. Color, you know, is like, is like so uncontrolled and liable to run away from you. And yet, look what you do with it. This is, this is the big color picture at Biltmore. This is, this is a container full of the same color echoes. And it's magnificent when you do it, even if you include signage in the overall concept, or color can be green, textural, in its many, many diverse forms. Longwood, this, has, this is the largest green wall in North America at Longwood Gardens. And do you know where it takes you? To the bathrooms. It's very exciting. You know, nature calls. <laughs> Don't encourage me. <laughs> Seriously. I just, or, <laughs> color. Get them to paint, this is Tom Sawyer's work. Get them to paint the walls. And pick a color that you couldn't live with at home but you've always wanted to try and see what it does to your community. 
People will line up on one side or the other. <laughs> it's true. But at least people notice, you know. I, and then look at this. Look at, he, he, he looks like my son. He has that approach to life that says, I'm going to challenge you to not like this. You know, look at him. <laughs> it's true. Even if you plant monochromatically, as long as you separate them with green, it makes it lovelier. This is a Terra Nova with Dan Himes. He's the Heuchera king. He hasn't met a Heuchera. He hasn't tried to change the color of. Or this, you know, look at the blues echoed with all of the blue in the flowers, which is one of the hardest colors to work into a natural setting, and also usually expensive, but here they've done it with petunias and alyssum. How wonderful is that? Not monocultural. I took this picture when I was at Monrovia. They're on the uh, west coast. And uh, Nicholas Stadden is their sales rep. And I said, Nicholas, those aren't what I think they are, are they? He said, well, what do you think they are? I said, I think they're barberries. He said, oh, yeah, that's, that's right, they are. Why would you be growing that many barberries? He said, well, people buy them. We have to stop telling people to plant barberries. You know, they're just not good. Even though they're color, we have other things now that do this. We don't need to plant things that are invasive or non-native or, or prickly. You know, I have enough friends that are like that. <laughs> here, here, look at this. This is one color and green. And there's nothing that says spring more than the color yellow. And, and who is it, does anyone from this town? I don't. It's, is it Monticello? I think so. I think so. It, it's, it's in the divider down the main street. Yes, Monticello, as opposed to the little, little mountain, which is Monticello, because it's Italian. D uh, Diana, how can I help me here? You know? It's, it, and texture, you know, this, this can come into play in very small spaces. Look, you can put it in hardscapes. All Chinese gardens, you need to take shoes off when you're walking a Chinese garden because invariably, now this is, this is the peach blossom, so you can, you can tell because of the texture under your feet which section, which, which season of the year you're in in a Chinese garden. That's why you have to walk barefoot. Or, or the textures of plants. We don't let our trees get old enough. Or if they are old enough, we see roots like this and we immediately think we have to cover them with mulch. You know, all those volcanoes. Don't do away with the volcanoes. You're going to have these marvelous things come up or textural plants. This, this I put in because John has most of these in his basement now. This is, this is just lovely. Or this. Now, how simple is this? This is textural. And it's in a situation, it's in a setting where you would normally just walk by. Look, it's all linear. It's all concrete and siding and it's horizontal and vertical. And it's, it's so unnatural that just that little touch of that easy, easy zinnia, petunia, alyssum combination in whatever color it would be is magic. And it's transportational. See, that bench on a concrete sidewalk on July the 28th, is not inviting. That bench next to that planter on July the 28th is an open invitation to sit down. It's a welcome. Or put a face on a wall. You know, I don't care. This, this was in, in, in a garden they called the Hobbit Garden. And, and the grandparents had done it for their grandchildren, for their grandchildren to play in. And they had these things, these bottles and these heads and these, these things stuck in the wall just to attract an interest. Space is another thing in consideration. You have big spaces. Here in the 1880s, Olmsted went south. It was after the war. He was forgiven. And, and uh, uh, the Vanderbilts decided that they were going to build this, 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 oh, this little house in the country. And, and, and Olmsted said, well, you can't build it on top of that mountain. This is not going to be Monticello. This is going to be built more, not less. <laughs> so he blew the top off of the mountain to make a bigger space. And look at what it is today. It's terracing. And you can go there. But in black and white, you know, it's yes and no. It's right and wrong. And we all know that this is the biggest house that was ever built in this country. And yet Olmsted is, is famed for the gardens. So you go there and you experience the gardens. And it's nature that anchors this house to the site. It's the setting, it's the environment, it's the fact that you can walk from here to 127,000 acres of woods. 
It's tiring to think about it, isn't it? Don't take the kids. They'll, they'll, they'll drop out in the, in the back 40. Here, space. Now, that could have been just a gazebo at the end of some cracked macadam. That could have been an unwelcoming, unfriendly environmental overlook. Two containers carries the space. Two containers. And, and look, Greeley said it well. Well, they have let it alone a good deal more than I thought they would. Somebody comes in with a landscape plan, they've got to plant trees, they've got to put grass, they've got to mow it, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that. You can do two containers to carry a huge space like that, and it's wonderful. Look at this. This, this space doesn't deserve to be called a space. It's an afterthought. It's a walk past, and yet that is a, a major entrance to the building. Doesn't it hurt your eyes? They came back, and look what they did. Now you want to get hooked. You do. This is, this is Woodstock, after all. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. I said, don't encourage me. This is the elephant in the room. Do things in threes. There's two containers and one elephant. You notice the elephant, but it's got a softened background. So it's comfortable, and, and yet it's not quite enough. It doesn't carry a large enough space. So put in a few more containers. Walk a little bit back and, and take a step out of the frame and then put the same containers up the steps. Expand the view. And then match it. And if you can, find another elephant. Maybe they'll mate at night. Can't you see them crossing that space? And then there's little blue elephants running around the gardens all next morning. I mean, it's just lovely. But then always, and always and forever, don't look in one direction only. Look out the other way. <gasps> oh, and those elephants are so happy there. It's a happy place. Ephemeral, past scale, Pat Lasagna. Yes, I know, great friend. Yes. I said, I said, look, that just fits you. She said, get everybody else out, it's just me. You know her. If you know her, that was her. That's right. She said, I, I can only take that. You will only take this with me in the picture. Me, me, me. Yes, that's right. It's very, very operatic, very, or, very much. Yes, it's Verdi. Ah, uh, me, me, me. And, and so she sat there and she said, am I, am I to scale? And I said, no, you're way over scale. And she said, then it's perfect. <laughs> you know, it all, it's just relationships. I know Pat. I've, I've appeared, she, I've appeared on, on, on a floor with her. Well, we've talked together. We've presented together. Oh, yes, that, that did come out wrong, didn't it? My wife would be embarrassed. <laughs> Oh, do we have the time? Let me think. Uh, uh, uh. Yes, time in a garden is something that is anachronistic, but it has to be noted. So here, everybody says, do you garden? Well, I do, actually. This is my front, this is my front door. And I, I do a lot of, I do, uh, at most, in a year when I knew I was going to be home for most of the summer, I had 95 containers. I do containers. I love containers. I'm in a container throwdown on tomorrow at the Philadelphia Flower Show. Anyway, I do containers. But you have to take into consideration what they're going to look like at the height of the season. This was that season. <laughs> Tiger Eyes Schumack had just come out and Bailey's had introduced it. They, nobody had it. And, and I knew the woman who was the marketing director for Bailey's, and they had it at, at a trade show, and I said, I want some. And she said, well, we don't have any. We're not shipping because it's not available and blah, blah. I said, but I really want some. And they said there was going to be this little tiny plant that was three foot by four foot. That's this, that's this, 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 this lime green shumac here, you know. <laughs> and in one season, in a container, it got six feet by four feet. I sent her the picture, and I said, how are we supposed to get to my front door? Well, she said, cut it down, it'll grow back. You know, that's like, okay, all right, well, that's what it is. Look, here, time. Excuse me? Oh, Schumach goes to five, four, yeah. And Tiger Eyes is just as good as any of them. I was, this isn't a plant lecture. You come to my plant lectures. We do all that crap, you know. <laughs> here. Speaking of crap, look. Now, this, most people would look at this and say, oh, my, this is an opportunity. 
But how many communities actually look at this and say this is an opportunity? How many people look at this and say, let's build a community around this pile of crap? <laughs> say, I'm serious. This is, this is what Sullivan County is. Look at this. Look. And kids, no less. And this one, this, she thinks she's superwoman. And she is because she made something out of nothing. And we don't teach people how to do that enough. Not with nature. How amazing is that? And look at the pride. Not only community pride, but personal pride because I did this. Here, look. Oh, dead laurels. There's no tribute to anything with dead laurels. Uh, it, it, it might be a Roman concept, but I have, you know, dead laurels. Let me think about that, you know. I, but here, look. It's happier now. It's probably watered, which is another thing. When people plant something, they take into consideration that nature needs water. And they make a commitment to it. Look, here, this is down the road. I went, I didn't know where CVI, I didn't know what or where CVI was, and I apologize for that. But I had been working with these pictures for such a long time that when I got off of 17, this building just drew me to it because, oh, yes, I know what you've done here. You've, you've renovated and renewed and revitalized and reused, how many of those can you stack up and not be excited about it? This is, this is what it's good. See, for us, for my business, we were talking about a lot of water issues, and it will come to every community. You have to now be very concerned about how you deliver water from one edge of the property to the other edge of the property, and we were asked to be putting in a lot of dry streams. Well, engineers think of dry streams as just one long kind of issue of putting hardscape on the ground. You have to make them into gardens because they will suck up a whole lot more water. Here, look at the Cornell Extension Office. Look what they did. They planted a quality of life. They put vegetative material next to the house and then somebody went out and took care of it. And here's my touch with Woodstock. This is right down the street. I was, in, I was at Cornell the summer of 1969. Man landed on the moon. Then we heard about this, this wonderful musical happening. And I had friends, and I said, wow, we're here. I, look, Janis Joplin, I got to do. And Jimi Hendrix, and oh my God, everybody's here. We got to do it. And we're, only, we're just across a couple counties. So we jumped in. He, Peter had, had a VW bug with a sunroof and no floor. <laughs> and remember all the floors went? It was just terrible. And we got across like four counties, and we were coming up, and there's all these people. And I was, look, I, this, is, I, this is what I was dressed in to go to Woodstock. It is. Three piece. I belong, you know, this, this, is, this, is, this was Cornell, you know, I mean, you have to dress to go to concerts. It's nothing, you know, we had no idea. We ran into this. <laughs> this is not quality of life. We turned around and went back to school. We had, we had ice cream at the dairy bar that afternoon. We heard about it on our, the AM transistor radios, you know, oh, there's, there's, there's traffic tie-ups on. Yes, there was. But there's all quality of life. And Cornell brought it to me and to upstate New York. And it's something that it, it's made me think about ever since then, that we passed that summer. And part of me is still stuck on the road to Woodstock. What happened to us? Where did we turn left? We didn't repeat all of the experiences we had. We didn't plant enough vegetables, and we certainly didn't have them hanging from containers. We didn't put tomatoes and basil together on a patio as a, as a repeat performance because it's something that we liked, especially if my son is a chef and he can make the mozzarella to go with it. You can repeat things, and in fact, you can add color to them magically. Are you tired yet? See, you have to, you have to experience this from the ground, from the roots up. This is, this is, this is where pedal hits the metal. Look, are you lost in a fog? Are you? Do you understand where I'm coming from? You've got to come in from the cold. You do. It's one of those opportunities that we have in life because the principles, balance, emphasis, scale, proportion, rhythm, contrast, the big pictures, the accumulation of all of the individual elements are best price. Principles can be bought for the best price. Isn't that cynical? But how true! I know that in the minds of a large body of men of influence, I have raised my calling 
from the rank of a trade, even a handicraft, to that of a liberal profession, an art, an art of design. Olmsted said that in the 1870s, and he believed that you can do that here. Look, here you have large groups of politicians saying that a knowing farmer understands how to plow, to sow, to mow, to hedge. And above all, Midas-like, he can convert everything he touches into manure. Can you imagine a politician today talking about manure and actually meaning it? You know, this, we come from a founding generation of agriculturists. It was into the science of farming, of agriculture, of soil and cultural improvement. The personal right to acquire property, which is a natural right, gives to that property, when acquired, a right to protection as a social right. The properties that we own have as much a part of the Bill of Rights as we do. And it's a long time since we need to remember that fact. Look at the pride of place and of property. No occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth, and no culture comparable to that of the garden. He meant that. So walk this way to the Jefferson lot. Let's take it to the nth degree. Balance is of Niagara Falls. Of course, there's all of the details of balance, symmetrical, radial, bilateral, all of the, the huge topiary forms that you can go to Europe and get lost in, all of the mazes of life, all of the nature that we remember as black and white. But it's the asymmetrical, it's the natural forms that I remember. And in the back bays of Boston, where Olmsted was the very first to create an Eden out of a swamp. It needs to be a balance of nature, the Fen ways. You know why there's a green wall in the baseball park in Boston? Because of Olmsted. Now, you never knew that, did you? Emphasis, that's what I try to leave people with, that there is a need, there is a, a striking, quaking need to be emphatic about the natural world, just like going to Yosemite where the emphasis is always on nature. Yosemite should be held, guarded, and managed for the free use of the whole body of people forever. That should be true of any town and community in this nation. And the scale here is coming to the core of the issue. Just put it out where a tree in maturity creates an oasis of shade. In New York City, where a hundred years ago this would have been a desert of concrete and macadam, make it in scale with the population, just like on top of the Metropolitan Museum of Art with all of their natural installations and sculptures, always in proportion, just like a city street, just like George Bailey, you know, just like all of the wonders of nature brought to that just small container on a lamppost or through a medial, just nature reminding people that we are in proportion and scale, whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. <laughs> whether, whether you are animal or mineral shaped like Plymouth Rock, whether you are vegetative at flowers for 50 cents, or whether you are young or old, you need to be in proportion, proportion to the whole scale of a acre or 127,000 acres, in proportion to nature, with the rhythm that moves through it. Think that there is always a band playing in the background. Think that there's bluegrass under your feet. Think that there's an echo that you can carry through to a generation lost in a garden with nothing but shapes out to the back. Shake hands, clap, applaud yourself for the work that you're doing. It's all in rhythm. Think of the passing of the ages and all of the other people that come into a collection of communities that you are celebrating here in the rhythm with nature that Sullivan Renaissance is celebrating, the contrast of a fall with what could be 
if we let it go. The contrast of the lushness of a garden that's tended with a hospital ward and an Ebola clinic. It can still come to all of us, the mighty sequoias that our grandchildren will thank us for preserving, or the offices that we cram ourselves into of a day. We must believe that the contrast will ultimately triumph, and all America will celebrate the success of this county. A man who sees things differently than the mass of ordinary men is classified as of defective vision, as of diseased brain. Well, then, I have no doubt that I was born with a defect of the eye, with a defect of the brain. Go out of an evening, look at the starry sky, and understand that you can either see stars or you can dream dreams. It is a challenge that I leave to you and to the communities that you so successfully, beautifully, and brilliantly represent. When you're finished changing, you're finished. And he sits there so pontifical. He can look down on us with that great age of wisdom and say, we're all born ignorant, but one must work hard to remain stupid. <laughs> yes. So work hard. Strive. Because we're giving this to the children, our children, all of our children, all of the communities of children that surround us. The world is our garden. Simple. The colors come seasonally. They're adjusted for the brilliance of, of man and nature. The world is our garden. Preserve it. Protect it. Nurture it. All of it. Celebrate it. Stand up and celebrate what you do because we are here today celebrating the joy of nature's combining with communities. And all of this is celebrating what John Adams said was a pride of place in patriotism. If we do not hang together, we shall most assuredly all hang separately. Thank you so much, and welcome to our gardens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are wonderful. This has been a marvelous day for me. The opportunity, thank you. Thank you so much. Kirk Ryan Brown, thank you so very much. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Before I offer some thank yous and other closing remarks, I want to draw attention to Sarah Rheingold in the audience. She is the Hudson Valley Regional Assistant for U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. She has copies of the Senator's grant guidelines, which outline various ways that community groups can access federal funding. She is available to speak with when we adjourn here in a few minutes. Thank you to all the organizations, companies, and individuals who contributed the wonderful door prizes, which are coming out now in a parade, <laughs> for our conference. And congratulations to the 2015 Sullivan Renaissance Award recipients. I hope you enjoyed Dr. Peter Tarlow and our distinguished keynote panel, and guest speaker Kirk Ryan Brown. Yeah, he was good. <laughs> oh, yeah. As you can see, this will be a very exciting year for Sullivan County, and Sullivan Renaissance hopes we can contribute our part and enlist you to help. In closing, there are a few people I would like to recognize and thank. Thank you, Senator Bonasek, Assemblywoman Gunther, and Legislator Samuelson for joining us today. Special thanks to our 2015 program sponsors. Special thanks to to our gracious hosts, Bethel Woods, Center for the Arts, and their talented staff, Megan Stalter, James Riley, Patrick Murphy, Robin Green, Greg Latordo, and Al DiOrio. Thank you all very much. 
Special thanks to our steering committee members, our volunteer core members, Sullivan Renaissance Bilingual Advisory Committee, and youth ambassadors for volunteering your time. Thank you, Robert Hayes and the students from Tri-Valley Agriculture and Future Farmers of America, Bob Dima and his Granite staff, Granite Associates staff, Diana Weiner, Kim Torrens, and Sandy Knackley for our beautiful floral displays for the conference. We could not do it without you. And please take one of these bulb plants when you leave today. You'll find them in a designated area outside the event gallery. Thank you, Tim Mailer and Ovations for the delicious refreshments, and Dawn Ryder and James Grinnell for your technical assistance. And a special thanks to my colleagues at Sullivan Renaissance, and especially Saray Gonzalez. Where are you, Saray? Saray is our program and events coordinator. Thank you so much for bringing together another successful event. And of course, our overwhelming gratitude to Sandra and Alan Gary. Thank you. For their commitment to this program and their generosity to make it happen. And last but most important, thank you, volunteers. <laughs> Sullivan County is on the move. Thank you. We're going to have some door prizes. I'd like to call up Aniko Hinata, who is our assistant in Sullivan Renaissance office. And uh, we have some beautiful baskets out here that have all been donated for today. So good luck to everyone. Sure. Does every yeah? Does everyone have a little blue ticket? No. Okay. Now, don't drop that. <laughs> okay, so, Kristen, you want to take all those baskets? Can you take one of those baskets? You can go from the bottom. Sorry. You can go from the bottom and take one of the baskets. And Aniko, you can pull a ticket, and I'll read the ticket off, number off. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah. Everyone have tickets now? First number is three two nine three three two. There we go. Come on up. <laughs> or Kristen will bring it to you. Kara Kowalski, would you come up here and help us distribute the baskets as well? Thank you so much. Kara is our volunteer coordinator for Sullivan Renaissance. The next number is 329-271. Hey, congratulations. Okay. And then we have 329-297. In the back there, congratulations. And we have Alan Frischman, who is our seasonal consultant. He's here helping us with the baskets as well. <laughs> Next number is 329-330. Oh, okay. <laughs> And then we have 329-282. Got it?
And we have 329311. I think they're all 329, so I'll just call the last three numbers 303. Oh, here we are. <laughs> Two, eight, four, last three numbers. Uh, Alan. Alan, Kara, do that one first. Yeah. Kara has the gardening equipment. <laughs> okay. Did you get a ticket? No. Okay. Last three numbers, three, two, five. There we go. And then we have this beautiful basket here that Alan is holding that is loaded full of goodies from Bethel Woods Center for the Arts from their uh, gift shop, and we'd like to thank them very much for that contribution. And the last three numbers, 255. Five. There you go. Congratulations, winners, and thank you again, everyone, for coming out today. <laughs>